Sean, thank you very much indeed. Um, and Joe, thank you very much for the invitation to come back to Glenties to, to speak uh, at this world-renowned summer school. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, recognize the stamina of everyone in the room. I, I understand that you've heard about 15 different speakers today, and you're, now you're listening to me at about 10 to 10, so sorry about that. Um, I also think it's been very useful if you are in Inishon and you look around closely, you might see people from the IMF on a constant basis there, which I think <laughs> for Donegal people is particularly useful. I, I'll always love coming to Donegal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, Dublin people have all kinds of pretensions that they can win the All-Ireland or two All-Irelands. <laughs> and uh, I was coming around uh, Bundoran, my car, this afternoon, busily minding my own business. And I love the humility of Donegal people. They're stuck up in the middle of the road for everyone to see. It was, welcome home, Sam. It, uh, <laughs> it really puts you down a few pegs, you know, it really does. Um, we came into government in 2011, and I suspect the expectation of a Fine Gael Labour government wasn't particularly strong. The reason we were voted in wasn't because we were Fine Gael and Labour. The reason we were voted in was because we weren't Fianna Fáil. And I know that as well as anyone in this room. But if you had told me in 2011, um, within two years, 2013, the things that have been achieved and the progress made, um, I don't think I, I would have believed you. And enormous progress has happened in this country, all down to the patience of our people. And I speak uh, in Brussels quite a lot to colleagues from other countries, in the 28 member states of the European Union, and all of them say, how have you managed to do this without protests and continuous street demonstrations? And I think that's largely down to people's history. It goes back to the point that Tony made. I think people do remember the 1980s in this country. And even older people remember at the time of the 50s and the mass immigration. And I think there is, broadly speaking, um, a political resolve to sort this problem out and to get the country back again. I think Irish people really love their independence, they are very proud people, uh, having been colonised, we recognise the importance of who we are and how we as Irish people value that independence. And when the IMF and the Troika came to town, that was a fundamental sundering of that independence that Irish people are very proud about. So some months away from full market access, to have achieved that thanks to the patience of the Irish people, I think is no mean achievement. And I want to recognise uh, the support that people have given us uh, in that regard. We were the second country into a bailout of the member states of the European Union. There are currently four uh, countries in a programme. We'll be the first country out of that programme. And I think that's a remarkable achievement, given the scale of the adjustment to what, about 25.5 billion over the course of the last six budgets. It's a fantastic achievement. Uh, but getting out of that programme and staying out of a programme and having long-term sustainable access to the financial markets has to be the key objective of who's in government, be it the Communist Party of Ireland, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil or whoever. There are no fundamental choices that people face as long as you are in a programme because you do not have the flexibility and the opportunity to lend on the money markets. And I also have to say that I deride this notion of the, the, the Troika as some kind of international bogeyman. The truth of the matter is this, that without this, the international support we obtained from our colleagues in the European Union and from the IMF, the scale of the adjustment in this country would be significantly worse than it has been. And that is the truth of the matter. I was struck by a colleague in Greece who recently said to me about the difficulties that they had faced. You know, he said, Brian, who are the first people who head, head north who leave a country? when this kind of cataclysmic event occurs. It's the people with wealth. It's the people with money. They have mobile assets and they have mobile capital they can move. But who are the people who are left? It's the pensioners, the carers, the people who depend on the state. And the fact of the matter is this. Without this international support, this country uh, would be a wasteland. And that is why uh, we have got to continue to correct this position and get the country working again. And I also recognise the point that Tony made when he spoke about political stability, and that is, by, by no stretch of the imagination, we can't all automatically assume it's here. We effectively have a wartime government. The two biggest parties in Dáil the Fine Gael Party and the Labour Party, 
have come together as a national government to see if we can correct this position over a period of years. It is, it is, it is like, a, like a wartime government. When one looks at the cost of borrowing 10-year Irish money, and Tony spoke earlier about the fact that states never pay back this money, they churn it over on a constant basis, and he's right about that. But in July of 2011, in 20, sorry, July of 2011, the cost of borrowing 10-year Irish money, if you are mad enough to want to buy it, was about 15%. Uh, two years later now, it's 3.8%. And that is an assessment of the international money markets that we have got our house in order and that we are heading towards a sustainable position of public finances. And the key message I have um, here, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is cutting through, getting to the point, as, uh, as you said, Peter, the key message I have is now is not the time to turn back. Having completed about 85 to 90 percent of this adjustment, now is the time to complete the job and to make sure that we can get this country working again. And to do that, we've got to stick to the course, difficult and all as it is, uh, that we have set for ourselves. And I recognize the difficulty in that. But take, take the, the case of where the 3.8% on the 10-year Irish money is at the moment. Lower than Greece, uh, lower than Portugal, lower than Cyprus, lower than Italy, lower than Spain. What does that say? That says clearly uh, that the international money market's view of this country is that we are getting our public finances uh, into, into a, a good condition, or at least a better condition than was hitherto the case. Um, Michael touched on an issue I want to take up, and I think he's very brave in what he had to say here tonight, and I congratulate him. He said that the issue, as we go into the next budget, is what will be the target in terms of the deficit by the end of 2014? Now, in the original Memorandum of Understanding, the objective was that we'd be under 3% by 2015, and I think it was 5.1 was the objective by, by uh, 2014. Um, and what he has said, courageously in my view, and I congratulate him for it, is that we should be aiming for a target less than that 5.1%, and I absolutely agree with him. I think the task, as we go into this budget, as we have in the last three, uh, two budgets under this government, we've consistently managed to get our deficit below the target we set. And I think it would be a very positive message indeed to say to the international audience and to the money markets especially uh, that our target, uh, looking at a deficit target for the end of 2014, should be lower than 5.1%, should be in the fours as a means of as exiting from the programme. I think that would give great stability uh, to the argument that not only are we going back to the markets, we are going back on a long-term sustainable basis. Uh, so I agree with them on that, uh, and that's my view. Uh, whether it's the government's view, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I spoke earlier about the 1980s. I, I'm haunted by the 1980s, largely because we were out of power for most of it. But the, the time that... Um, the time that we were in power, we didn't do a good job. The Fine Gael Party and the Labour Party elected after the disastrous 77 Fianna Fáil election manifesto. That's my one bit, bit of partisan politics over for the night. Um, didn't do a good job. We were asked to clear up a mess and we didn't do it. And what happened in the 1980s and the early 1990s is this decade long of high unemployment, high immigration, poor living, living standards, where the brightest, the best, the most talented ended up as CEOs in London and Frankfurt and elsewhere. And I speak to people a lot in my constituency and elsewhere, and we don't want to go back to that. And I think taking control of the public finance position, something that we should have done in the 80s, and it did take Ray McSharry and Alan Jukes in the Tala strategy, if the truth be told, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, to actually take control of the public finance position. And why is it important in this country? It's especially important to a small open, highly deleveraged economies such as Ireland. We have a very privatised economy. It's not, it's not a huge public sector uh, in this economy, despite all of the, the media attacks on the public sector. There isn't, actually. But we have actually quite a, a nimble, uh, deleveraged, privatised economy in this country. And I think it is crucially important that the public finance position of small, open economies like Ireland is, is clear uh, for all to see. So that's why it's important, I think, that we fix, fix this uh, deficit position that we, are, that we are in at the moment because confidence is key and uh, that confidence is returning. I think it was Megan Green said, um, she, she at the time worked, worked for Rubini Economics, she said on, to Sean O'Rourke, I keep reminding him of this, um, that Ireland 
would need a second bailout, that we wouldn't manage to get back to the market. She said that last year. Well, she was wrong. And all of those people who said that we wouldn't get back to the markets were wrong. There were many people who said at the time uh, that the euro wouldn't survive. Well, they're wrong about that. The euro is going to survive. Despite all of the, the politicking and the you know, hypolavid diplomacy that goes with a lot of these meetings, and I've attended them uh, on regular occasions, um, the fact of the matter is this, the euro is going uh, to survive. But there are risks. There are risks to our major trading partners, uh, like the UK, uh, which obviously sees very sluggish growth at the moment, and especially within the Eurozone. There are risks in the Middle East because of uh, the oil price and the political difficulties that are there. So we have to take all of these things into consideration in making sure that we get our budget back on track. On this question of austerity of, uh, uh, fatigue, the fact of the matter is that in this year, 2013, we're still spending 22% more than we're taking in. And I think, as Peter said, we're borrowing one billion a month just to keep uh, the show on the road. Now, that cannot continue. Uh, when I learned economics, uh, there were three ways the textbooks told us of fixing a deficit. You either reduce expenditure, you shove up tax, or you get that magical thing that Charlie Hawley used to speak about growth. You remember when he said famously in the early 90s, we're going for growth. And I used to wonder, as a young teenager, what that actually meant. What actually it means is if for every 1% of GDP growth, you get about 1.6 billion to play around with, to spend on the things you want to spend on or to pay off your debt. So there has to be that understanding that it isn't just about tax and expenditure, it has to be about growth as well. And in a circumstance where we have no money, we have got to use every opportunity possible to leverage funding to this country, funding from the European Investment Bank especially. I spoke earlier to a colleague, I mean, President Hoye, who is the president of the European Investment Bank, met him recently in Luxembourg. He says this year there's up to 630 million available of borrowings to this country for capital projects. But that can only be done on a commercial basis. We cannot go back uh, to the appalling vanity projects and the, the madness of decentralization and all that went with that if we are really going to get this country uh, back on track. And the real elephant in the room, as it were, is the cost of that debt. Uh, last year, 2012, six billion of your taxes was spent on paying the interest on our national debt. This year, it will be eight billion. It's close to about 20% of the total taxes we take in in this country. That is not a sustainable position, ladies and gentlemen. And in a circumstance where 80% of the international repayments on Irish um, government debt leaves the country, that's also a loss of resource, a loss of opportunity uh, to, this, to this country. So that is why it is important that we continue along this path to manage our economy and to build up the resilience that is required uh, to have long-term uh, sustainable market access. So what's going to happen with the Troika leave? Um, I was interested by the observations of colleagues here tonight. And there's just six points I want to make. Firstly, I think as, as, as Tony rightly said, the truth of the matter is surveillance will continue through the six-pack, through the two-pack, through the fiscal compact treaty. This is a reality. This is part of the new European architecture. And the other outcome from this is, ladies and gentlemen, I think, I think it's inexorable and it's logical. We are going to see more Europe, not less. We are going to see further integration in Europe, not less. And I think the countries which embrace that and see the full opportunities of that single currency and that single market are the countries that will come back quicker. And we, as a small open economy, can come back quicker because basically our, our private sector economy is sound. So Europe, in my view, is going to be a huge issue for this country, irrespective of the presence of a troika or not. Secondly, we need more long-term thinking and planning, and I agree with Michael McGrath on that. Difficult decisions have to be taken. Why was it the case that in, after the financial collapse in Finland, they decided to restructure their education system, huge changes in the university side that Tony referred to earlier, huge changes in education. It wasn't all about just pumping money in, it was radical change. Look what happened from that, the Nokias that Rory Quinn speaks about. The huge technological advances occurred from that fundamental change in public policy. The Danes introduced Flex Security, which is all about helping unemployed people to get important training quickly so that they can have a chance of getting back to work again. So what I'm saying is long-term planning like that is required in this country as well. Thirdly, you know, the truth of the matter is, from 2000 to 2009, 
public expenditure in this country went up by 150%. Did we see value in that? We saw a lot of spending. But did we really see the value that was required? And many of the critics of that public expenditure were public servants themselves who saw wasteful expenditure, but because of our system weren't able to speak up or speak out against their political masters who are directing this kind of uh, crony political expenditure. So we need fundamental change in the doll, the way in which that proper watchdog role would be given on public expenditure. Fourthly, we now have an independent fiscal advisory council. That's going to change the context, in my view, of all political debates, not just at election time. Because when Professor McHale and his colleagues speak now, it kind of, it kind of um, predates the political conversation that follows that. And I think that's very, very important. We now have people who are listened to. And we also have a po population that are economically literate. People actually have never t taken as much interest in economics and are prepared to ask politicians tough questions about the long term, which they always should have. And we also need change in our public sector because that change is crucial in producing the kind of dynamic public servants uh, that will be essential for the future. Finally, what we need is this more than ever before. We need lots of contrary people. That's why summer schools are very useful. We need people who will speak out, who will put me, my colleagues, Michael, whoever, under pressure. Because if there's one thing we've learned from this crash, it is the appalling connection of groupthink that existed in this society for far too long. People didn't speak out, and where they did speak out, they were ignored. And we need that genuine debate in this country for people, for robust debate, and for public policy debate to make sure we get the best option for our people. I believe there's a huge future for this country. I have never been as honoured to serve in government because in years to come they will be writing about this uh, about this experiment that we've had to undergo. I suspect they won't be writing about me, they'll be writing about Michael Lewin and Brendan Howland, I hasten to add. But it's important that we get the country back to a stable footing. And with the support of the Irish people, we are going to get there. Thank you very much.